Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the final lecture for psychology of personality or personality psychology, Psych 209. Uh, this is Professor Bradley Mitchell coming to you. Uh, today, we're going to be covering um, kind of the integration of the personality process, uh, looking at character and personality and how it determines uh, motivation and emotion and how different um, different ways of perceiving uh, a person's personality may be interpreted differently uh, because of the way that we have our preconceived notions and our different thought processes. So the objectives for today's lecture are that we're going to discuss the history of the personality process and we're going to look at these four uh, major functions the perception the thoughts or cognitions the motivation and emotion when it comes to personality so when we're talking about personality process we're talking about those four things we're talking about perception how we take in information and how we uh, un universally and also subjectively uh, interpret what's going on with an individual and then the thoughts and cognitions that go along with that that are going to be uh, somewhat skewed by our own subjective experience. Uh, it's going to be skewed by emotion. It's going to be skewed by uh, the way that we think and what we're motivated to do. As we understand these four basic concepts and we understand ourselves, we are better able to understand someone else's personality, their character, um, their motivation, their emotion, and that person as a whole. And so as we've looked at different personality theories and traits and uh, ways of assessing personality historically, we can kind of wrap those together now. And we can look at the historical roots of research into the personality process, what makes up an individual's personality. One of the things that we've talked about throughout the semester is learning or conditioning or the behavioral model of psychology. When it comes to personality, the behavioral model and the learning model is very uh, easy to dismiss because it's it's an oversimplified way of looking at life that uh, I am exposed to certain things and I react in a certain way. Um, we know that the behavioral process has been effective as a means of learning about yourself, but a lot of times it's hard to figure out what people are doing when we're using a behavioral model because we don't know all the antecedents. We don't know all the precipitating factors. So a lot of times we have this notion that uh, we can't know unless we know everything. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a misleading way of looking at personality. We don't have to know everything that led up to a person who, wh where they are today to be able to understand who they are today. What a person has been through is good information, but it really doesn't matter how a person gets to the personality or the character that they have today. What you as an individual or what I as an individual need to know when I'm trying to use uh, the personality process is that the person is in this state right now. OK, so when we look at phenomenology, um, we, we emphasize the way that that person is right now all of that baggage all of that history is great in the realm of understanding uh in a more in-depth way in a, in a psychoanalytic way or in um in, in a, maybe a more social way and we can look at it going backwards in forensics or we can look at it in um in psychiatry or, or um, mental health counseling uh but when you're working with someone or in some situation what you need to be concentrating on is what is going on in that moment, not so much what has happened before. And so we look at these things like psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, again, anytime we have psycho at the beginning, we're, we're going to usually attribute it to, as a Freudian or a neo-Freudian concept. Um, and we've talked about Freud. We've talked about the id, the ego, the superego. We've talked about the levels of consciousness. Um, all these things are incredibly important. But again, as we are dealing with people in, in the here and now, those underlying things are not nearly as important. The, the uh, superego and the id are important to understand where a person's coming from, but really we're only looking at the ego because that's what's manifesting in front of us. And so we always fall back on the trait approach, that we look at traits and those different traits are based upon that person's 
level of need or level of uh, emotional progress in their life at that moment. If you look back on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, wherever you might be in that process, that is going to dictate your personality and your character and your persona at that moment. The different thoughts and feelings and desires that you have are going to be changing by the drives that you have and also the, uh, the requirements that are being thrust upon you. If you are in need of money at this very moment, you are going to act differently than if you have you know, quite a bit of money saved up and you come up into a, uh, a traumatic experience, you're going to act differently. Your character is going to be slightly different. Even though all things being equal, your character stays the same, the way that your personality actually comes about is going to be slightly different. And that's because of the traits coupled with the environment, coupled with what is going on in a person's life at that very moment. And so we get back to perception. Perception is something we talked about you know, early in Psych 101, introduction to psychology. People are predisposed to perceive the world in different ways. We, we look at the world through different lenses. And one of the things that I really want to hearken back on from Psych 101 or maybe other psychology or sociology classes that you have taken in the past uh, is the notion of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is uh, a derivative of priming and uh, chronic accessibility that we look for things in ourselves that match what we think about ourselves and we look for things in other people that match what we think about them. And sometimes this comes from generalization or this comes from discrimination, uh, not necessarily discrimination we think about when we think about cultural or racial or religious issues, but the, the real discrimination when it comes to conditioning and learning that uh, we discriminate down to what we're actually triggered by. And part of our personality is that we have this discrimination factor. We have this, uh, this notion that we tend to look for things that match uh, what, uh, what it is we're looking for. Um, one of my favorite um, uh, neuropsychology philosophy authors is a guy by the name of Daniel Dennett. And the way that he describes this is, is very uh, spot on in my mind. Um, he, he asks the question, why are there so many more um, accidental shootings in the world of hunters towards the end of the hunting season rather than at the beginning. What, what the question is, if you look at statistics, um, there are always a lot more um, accidental shootings of other humans or uh, the wrong type of animal um, towards the end of the season rather than at the beginning. And this is basically, according to Dennett, because of our um, our confirmation bias of what we are looking for. At the beginning of hunting season, we are looking for the specific type of animal. So in Indiana, we have deer hunting season. And so there are certain types of deer that you can shoot and some that you can't, if they're too young or uh, you know different features, you can't shoot them. So at the beginning, people tend to be very discriminative. They tend to pick this, the, the, the animals that they want to shoot. But at, towards the end of the season, if you haven't shot any deers, if you haven't gotten your quota yet, all of a sudden, instead of looking for the right deer, you're looking for a deer. You are looking for anything and your mind is, is quite simply going, uh, is this a deer? Is this not a deer? Where before you were saying to yourself, is that the right kind of deer? Is that the kind of deer that I want to shoot? Uh, because, you know, maybe it's not as big as maybe I'll get one later on in the season. And all of a sudden you're doing this binary way of thinking that you go for confirmation bias that, wow, that thing is moving. Deers move. I'm going to shoot it. Even when it, it, it's by no means a deer, it's a, it, it's a horse or it's a human with a with orange, uh, you know, uh, orange vests on. A lot of people will say, I thought it was a deer. And you think like, wow, how could they think that? Well, because that's the way our mind is triggered when we're looking for a confirmation of a certain thing. And so our priming tells us how what we're looking for in people. And so if you meet someone who looks like or smells like or walks like somebody you already know, you're going to be primed to think of them in a certain way. And that is our perception. It has nothing to do with how that person actually acts. It has to do with your perception of what a person like that person should be acting like. And so we have this idea of rejection sensitivity. And rejection sensitivity um, affects our interpretation of ambiguous signals. Um, and this really goes back to that confirmation bias or self-fulfilling prophecy that we tend to reject things that don't match up with our schema and we tend to accept things that do. 
And so when we have these notions of a situation that matches a few key components of things that we uh, have experienced in the past or the things that we have thought about in the past, we may uh, engage in some very inconsistent behavior because we're not matching exactly what it is that, uh, that we should be in that given situation. Um, and so our perceptual defense is very similar to psychoanalytic defense mechanisms such as um, rejection or repression or transference. Um, people can have a physiological reaction to emotionally charged words before they're consciously aware of it. Think about words that people have a visceral response to. Um, I, I'm not going to give them out right now because I, I think we're all smart enough, we're all aware enough to know, but I will you know, allude to some of them. Um, you know, any type of racial epitaph, um, any type of religious derogatory term, any type of gender um, derogatory term. We may have a reaction to this before we even realize that we're having a reaction to it, which means that we're not cognitively aware of it. We're not cognitively having a reaction. It's a visceral reaction. And so the implication to that is when we try to get people to uh, to react differently in certain situations when they're um, when this perceptual defense comes up, uh, they may not be able to do that because it's happening prior to conscious awareness. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that someone has to be called uh, a, a term that would consider we would consider bigoted. Uh, it could be that someone looks like someone who in the past has used bigoted terms, and our perceptual defense would actually kick in. Think about this. Think about the, uh, the the election that we just had in 2016. Think about the way that uh, people who were on one side versus another were automatically given certain personality traits, certain characteristics, certain characters. Um, you know, people on one side were if you, if you had a red cap on that said "Make America Great Again," a lot of people automatically just said, "Well, that person is a bigot. That person is a racist. That person is a homophobe." If you look at people on the other side, you uh, say that that person supports uh, a, a criminal and and, and they, uh, they they don't care about the rule of law. Whatever it is you want to throw at that certain situation, we may not even know that we're doing it. It's something that is so is so ingrained in us that it's automatically going to happen. Our thoughts are what happen after perception. So we, we've already said there are some things that are happening that happen well beyond or well before we even can think about it. But our thoughts do determine most of our actions. We do have a conscious awareness of what we are doing. However, not all thinking is conscious. Uh, there are things that are happening underneath. Remember the iceberg analogy of consciousness. We have the, the subconscious and the unconscious that are traditionally, they're thinking. You know, we don't have, we're not privy to what's going on, but it's, there, there's a level of thinking, a level of thought going on. And this gets into some thought experiments that are well beyond personality psychology, a, a psych 209 class. Um, there are thoughts about if, if I am the thinker, if I'm the conscious mind, and there are other thinkers going on at the same time, and let's say that there's some contradictory thoughts going on, that my conscious mind is saying one thing, my unconscious mind is saying another, what does that mean about the whole notion of dualism? Remember dualism from Psych 101. One of the very first things we learn about in Psych 101 is Descartes and dualism, that we have a mind and we have a body and they're linked together. Uh, we know that Descartes wasn't 100% accurate. We know um, that you know, it wasn't connected to the pineal gland, which was Descartes' theory. Um, there's also people today that still believe in the dualistic notion. There are people who say that there is no such thing as dualism. Um, but to, to, if we just go ahead and accept dualism for this particular argument, you know, what does it mean when my mind and my body are doing one thing, but I also have this other, um, you know, mind and body are here, but then I have over here my unconscious mind and my subconscious mind, and every once in a while they're going to come up and interfere with my conscious thinking. Um, our consciousness is what we are thinking about at this very moment. It's our working uh, and short-term memory, which is incredibly limited, and that means that everything else that's going on is going on behind the scenes in our long-term memory and our unconscious and subconscious. Um, we know that be, to be conscious means to be aware. And the altered states of consciousness are times where we are not 100% aware of our surroundings. 
Um, those altered states of consciousness are something as benign as sleeping and something as sinister as intoxication through drugs or alcohol, or sometimes there's an altered state of consciousness that comes from uh, prayer or meditation or yoga, or sometimes there can be an altered state of consciousness where somebody is actively psychotic, where they are delusional or they're hallucinating. Uh, and all of those things are going to change the level of consciousness in an individual and how they're going to think. People can do things without knowing why and know things without knowing, knowing that they actually do know it. Um, the, the example I use here is many of us took a, uh, a foreign language in high school, yet we probably don't feel like we are fluent in that language. Um, however, if somebody comes up to you uh, and says something in a foreign language, you don't know that you know it, but for, there's something in that long-term memory that actually has um, some, uh, some knowledge because that memory hasn't really gone away. I took uh, Japanese and Spanish. So if someone comes up to me and says, Sumimasen, ego ga wakaremasu ka? I know they're speaking Japanese. I know kind of what they've said, but not 100%. My conscious mind is saying, you don't speak Japanese anymore. My unconscious mind is saying, dude, we know some of that stuff. Send it down and I'll see what I can send back up to you. The unconscious is so important because we can do things without thinking. How many times have you driven home from work and you just kind of realize that, wow, I got home and I don't remember driving at all. You're, you're on that autopilot. Um, you're doing dishes and you don't have to consciously think about scrubbing the plate. Um, there's a lot of things that you do unconsciously that if you try to do it consciously, you completely screw up. And what I always tell people in Psych 101 is, you know, after we talk about this whole notion, I tell them, OK, now I want you to go out and I want you to really think about walking. I want you to think about putting one leg in front of the other and keeping your balance and walk upstairs and make sure that you don't fall over a tip. And all of a sudden, something that you do every single day without thinking becomes kind of taxing because you're trying to have your conscious mind do it when your unconscious mind is what is really um, the thing that, that should be doing it. It's the same thing with doing your signature. If I tell you to sign something and make sure that it is a perfect signature, it's your signature. If I were to just tell you to sign something, you would just whip it out and it would be your signature. But if I tell you to think about it, do it correctly, do your signature, I want it to be perfect. A lot of times people sit there and think about it and all of a sudden their signature gets all screwy because it's something their conscious mind is trying to accomplish that really their unconscious mind should be doing. And so we have this dual process model. Um, there's an awesome book. If you're interested in learning more about this, it's a, a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's this dual process model of thinking where there is conscious mind and unconscious mind or thought cognitive and impulsive reflexive. Um, Freud's theory was this is the irrational and irrational thought that rational is what we think through irrational is just what we do. But the dual process is basically that we have two different uh, ways of thinking. And sometimes we're going to react quickly and sometimes we're going to think things through. There's a positive to both. And in certain situations, we need to use one or the other. Uh, the cognitive experiential self theory. See, this is a, one of those uh, two ways of thinking where it seeks to explain unconscious processing uh, and the seemingly irrational emotion driven sectors of the mind. It's uh, that the unconscious mind is uh, is basing things upon previous experiences and emotions that we have. And the rational system is taking in information and it really is, is a quasi uh, scientist at all times. It's doing, uh, it's experimenting and experiencing things and taking those things in and seeing how to actually process them in an appropriate way. And so when we look at the different ways that we can look at this dual process model, one of the more popular ones is Epstein's dual process model. And there's the rational and the experiential system. It, the rational system is analytic. It takes time to think. Um, the experiential is holistic, takes everything into account and then spits something out. Um, the, the rational system is logic. The um, uh, experiential system is, um, is effective, meaning that it's driven by mood and how we actually feel about things. So when we look at the CEST, there's different systems that generate different decisions and we can actually come up with two different decisions. Think about the fact that, you know, you can be thinking about choosing between uh, you, you need to go out and buy a new car. And so you're trying to decide um, you have a spouse and three kids. And so you go to the dealership and there are two cars sitting there that you like. One is a minivan, which makes a whole lot of sense. The other is a Corvette. Um, let's say for some weird reason, they're the same price. 
And so your, um, uh, your rational system is going to say, yeah, the Corvette, that's awesome. And I would love to drive it, but you know what? I'd have to strap my kids to the trunk and CPS might be called. So this isn't a good idea, but the experiential is saying, yeah, we're going with the Corvette. This would be awesome. Uh, the experiential is not always our best option. It's uh, Freud would postulate that it's more driven by id where the rational system is more driven by superego. And so uh, going back to that Freudian notion of the dual process system, or, I'm sorry, going with the, the, the Freudian notion of um, it ego superego and comparing it to the dual process model, we can say that this rational experiential system is like the id and the superego. And so the, the ego is the manifestation of taking those two systems and putting them together and having uh, the systems actually interact with each other so that you get a, a decent um, livable um, outcome. So when we look at all these things, we have to get to that point of motivation. Motivation is what takes us from a thought. This is where we are today with a thought, and I'm going to push myself to get to where I want to go. Motivation is based upon drive. Drive is I don't have something right now or there's something that doesn't feel right, and I want to get somewhere else. What's interesting about humans, and we can all sit here and say that we are rational people. You know, if you've studied economics, we're, we're almost always basing uh, economic principles on the rational person, yet most humans are not rational. People do not always behave consistently with their stated goals. Okay. Motivation doesn't always do everything for us. If motivation was all that was required, everybody would have a 4.0. Everybody would be taking a full load and not skipping classes. Everybody would be healthy. Uh, you know, if it was just motivation to get into shape, everybody would be the shape that they wanted. They'd be as healthy as they wanted. But if you think about it, somebody may say, I want to, uh, you know, it's almost summertime here. And so people are, oh, I want to get that beach body or I want to get into better shape or I want to lose some weight or gain some weight so that I'm more healthy. And then we go out to dinner and we eat 4,000 calories of pure fried crap. And so our behaviors are not always consistent with what we say our motivation is. And so one of the ways that our personality can help match up with motivation is to set goals, both short-term and long-term goals. Um, the the short-term, the long-term goals are the ones that we want to set that tell us where we want to be in a, uh, a finite amount of time. The short-term goals are things that we can achieve along the way. This is why I absolutely love when I have students who come to Ivy Tech who are they have a they have a big professional uh, goal. They have a big professional roadmap ahead of them that may include a bachelor's or a master's or a technical certificate, a graduate certificate or a doctorate, uh, a professional degree. Um, I think that one of the most important things uh, or one of the best things that you can do is to come to Ivy Tech or not even Ivy Tech, but just anywhere that offers an associate's degree on the way to the bachelor's because four years is a long time. Four years is an incredibly long time to set up for a goal. And the associate's degree is awesome because it gives you another short-term goal in the meantime while you're working. It gives you something uh, that is tangible that you can work towards. It gives it another, uh, another thing that you've achieved. And so as you're working towards your ultimate goal, you have set these things up that you can celebrate on the way. I, I always like to use myself as an example whenever I can. And this is a, a situation where, you know, looking back, you know, I wish I would have uh, taken more, given more honor to the steps along the way when I was on my academic career path, because I never celebrated uh, getting through a semester. I never, I didn't celebrate getting my bachelor's degree. I didn't celebrate getting my master's degree because my goal was to get a postgraduate degree. And uh, that's, I never really celebrated. And even to be honest, I didn't even celebrate when I uh, got my, my, my doctorate because I'm working towards another doctorate that, uh, that I see is, is going to be even more beneficial to me. And so at no time did I ever really step back and say, hey, look, I accomplished something because I've just kept going. And, you know, and, and it's, there's been some times where I've gotten incredibly burnt out and I've had to kind of take a step back and say, hey, you know, I, I have accomplished some things, even though uh, I haven't, you know, hit where 
I haven't hit where I want to be by this time. Uh, I've done a whole lot of things and I need to be able to sit back and say, you know, that really, uh, th those things really hit my current concerns and my personal projects and what I'm striving for. So I, I love the fact, even if you have every intention of going on to get a bachelor's degree in nursing or education or whatever it is you're studying, such a great idea to get an associate's degree, especially here from Ivy Tech. There's my little commercial uh, because A, it gives you something along the way. Um, it gives you something to kind of hang up and say, look, I've accomplished an associate's. I have this credential and now I'm just going for more and more and more instead of saying, oh my God, I want a doctorate, but that's 12 years away. I'm never going to get there. You're getting these little kind of trinkets. Uh, I'm not calling an associate's degree a trinket, but uh, you're getting these little carrots along the way to help you get through your goals. And so um, I'm not going to go over the, uh, the different types of goals because I think that that's a little bit beyond what we want to talk about in this particular course. Um, but I want to get through uh, and get to emotion, which is a big part of personality. It's something that we, we kind of divorce from personality when we first started talking about um, traits and types of personality because emotion seemed like it was something that was too dynamic. Uh, that it changed and personality was something that was relatively static. But emotion is a type of knowledge. It's a type of way of thinking. It's a type of mental set and physical procedures that do have an impact on personality and personality assessment. And so when it comes to emotion, we, we both uh, go through these stages ourselves and we also do it when we're looking at other people. So the basic stages are appraisal, physical responses, facial expressions, nonverbal behavior, motives. Um, these can all be happening at the same time. They can be happening independently. And because emotion and, and the interpretation of emotion and the expression of emotion is so multifaceted, it's incredibly complex. And we sometimes have a hard time really deciphering what we're feeling, what we're emoting, and what other people are uh, giving us. And so the possible sources can be immediate stimuli. They can be classically conditioned things that we, we don't even think about, or there can be memories or thoughts. Uh, for example, if, I, uh, if I'm sitting here and I'm smiling at you while I'm talking, but I constantly uh, rub my chin, and you had somebody who would constantly rub their chin every time they were going to yell at you. Uh, maybe you had an abusive individual or just somebody who was kind of a jerk to you. And every time they do this and then they start yelling at you, I can be sitting here smiling and talking, but classical conditioning is going to make you have a different emotion because I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm happy, I'm talking to you and I'm using my hands. But if somebody else used their hands a lot and then that got them upset, the classical conditioning may make your emotion change or it may uh, misinform your, uh, your interpretation of my emotions. And so there's a ton of varieties of emotions and, and everybody experiences things differently. And this is one of those existential questions of, is there, is there really a solid, this is happy, this is sad, this is anger, this is whatever. Um, in my personal opinion, no, I think it's, it's very, um, subjective. I think we all know what happy is, but my happy isn't necessarily your happy. Uh, but there are core emotions that we look at, and it's kind of this circle with six different points. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, surprise, and disgust. Uh, one very interesting thing, I'm not going to go over with you, but I can't, you know, this is one of those things where you, you have to do it outside of class because it's not something that's in the curriculum. But if you look up um, Paul Ekman, and uh, micro expressions. Uh, Ekman has this online course um, that can, tr can train you to detect what are called micro expressions, which are um, little leaks that people give that tell you how they're really feeling about a certain situation. If you watch the show Lie to Me that was on Fox about five or six, seven years ago, um, it was based off of Paul Ekman's work. And a lot of uh, criminal justice people, a lot of um, uh, human resource people, psychologists, poker players, they will oftentimes use um, this training in micro expressions to figure out what people are really thinking before they try to mask it. Uh, if you're trying to figure out if your significant other is hiding something from you, you can ask them a question and they're going to give off a micro expression that they really can't stop. And then they're going to put on their, uh, their persona. And so if they're lying to you, they're, they're, ooh, they're a little surprised. They're not going to be that animated, but they're going to give a little bit of, oh, what's up? Oh, and then they're going to go, oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And uh, it, can, it can give you an idea about what they're actually feeling. It's not always perfect, but it is a, it's an incredibly interesting um, uh, training that you can go through. 
And so when we look at the stimuli response um, of the different emotions, we have these five different emotions that we're going to look at here of anger, guilt, anxiety, sadness, and hope. Um, we can see that the stimulus and the response are going to be helping us. They have an adaptive function. So let's go to anxiety because anxiety is a very interesting uh, emotion because it is the uh, fear in the absence of an actual stimuli. So the possibility of harm. Okay. And so if I anticipate danger, I can escape harm. So if I have anxiety that um, there, there might be something that might happen, such as um, it, it, let's say that I have anxiety that I might get into a car wreck and might, my car might go into a river and into a lake. Um, I, I've just read a couple of months ago that one of the reasons that the head seat, the headrest in your car are designed the way that they are so that you can, in that situation, pull them out. And there's two metal posts that you can use to break out your window. Okay. So if I had high anxiety about you know, let's say I lived in Minnesota and there's 10,000 lakes. I'm afraid I'm going to fall into one of those lakes. Uh, and so I read up on it. My anxiety has caused me to worry about the possibility of harm. And so I've anticipated the danger. Now I know if I ever fall in a lake in my car, I just pull my headrest out and I can break out the window and I escape harm. So anxiety is, uh, and it, it, it's, it allows me to adapt to certain situations that, you know, may not be always going to be there, but they might be problematic in some way. Everybody experiences emotions differently. They're a core aspect of who you are. Some people react differently to certain situations. Some people can have the most traumatic things happen to them and uh, they don't flinch. Other people can get a mosquito bite and the world is going to end. There is no right or wrong in this affective intensity, it basically just comes down to how you act in certain situations. However, this notion of emotional intelligence is something that has taken hold in the last 20 years in, in the realm of psychology and psychiatry and mental, uh, mental wellness. Uh, emotional intelligence is related to uh, emotional expressiveness, quality of personal relations, and levels of optimism and cognitive control. Essentially, those key intangible features that most employers are looking for in good employees. Can you be good with customer service? Can you be, uh, can you hold yourself uh, together under fire? Can you, uh, can you, can you be in the kitchen where it's really hot and still hold yourself together? Can you get yelled at by a customer and, and not blow up yourself? That's emotional intelligence. But the one key thing that everybody wants, everybody wants to be happy. And psychologists have long kind of looked at what does it mean to be happy? And they've come up with three big components to what happiness is. Overall satisfaction with life, um, satisfaction with particular life domains identified by you, and general high levels of positive emotion and low levels of negative emotion. So happiness is basically feeling good, being satisfied with the big picture of life, where I'm going and where I am right now in certain things. The concept of happiness can vary throughout life. Uh, my daughter is seven and her happiness are Shopkins and watching uh, PBS in the morning. Um, that is not my happiness. My happiness is seeing her happy. It's seeing my family happy. And so um, my, con my concept has varied with age. Uh, you know, I think that's an absolute. I think um, if you look at uh, lifespan development, you're going to see what matters to people throughout life. Um, most people no matter what, are hedonistic, meaning that they seek out pleasure. Uh, and sometimes that looks a little off because some people actually appear to be very altruistic. And, and, my, and this is just my personal opinion. I don't believe in altruism. I believe that every person is hedonistic, that they seek out pleasure. And for some people, the notion of altruism, the, the notion of helping other people before yourself, the notion of being giving actually is hedonistic for them because they feel good about it. And so it's a, it's a vicious circle. Yes, you can be altruistic. You can be Mother Teresa, but you wouldn't do that unless you, you truly liked it. There's very few people who are altruistic if they don't feel good about it. I mean, think about uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates is worth so much money that he literally keeps making money, even though his goal by the end of his life is to have given all of his money away to different charities and different foundations. But he, his wealth keeps going up, even though he's giving away millions and millions and even billions of dollars. 
Uh, you know, I think that's hedonistic that he's giving it away because it makes him feel good. It looks as though to outsiders that he's being altruistic, that he's helping. And he is. He is in a functional way being altruistic, but he's being hedonistic in the respect that he's feeling good about what he's doing. And so when we look at the sources of happiness, um, happiness is half a set point. This is one of those theories in, in personality psychology. I'm not going to go over a whole lot. Um, but set point is this is what this is your baseline that I am happy no matter what 50 percent of the time and then in um, intentional activity um, I am eating an ice cream cone that makes me happy circumstances I am at Ivy Tech right now in Valparaiso that can make me happy or unhappy um, I'm lecturing right now that's an intentional activity that's either going to make me happy or unhappy but it's going to be based upon my set point am I going above or below what makes me happy the consequences of happiness um, it can make some great outcomes. It can also have a dark side um, because a lot of times when we're happy, we tend not to be striving towards anything uh, better. And so, um, you know, I, I look at people who get comfortable at their job and so they stop striving uh, to better themselves. They uh, maybe a person who uh, gets a bachelor's degree and had every intention of going on to get a master's, but they get a really good job right out of college and they're happy but then something happens to that company and it, it falls apart and they lose their job and that happiness falls apart for them simply because uh, they didn't seek out. They, they were fine with being happy, but it, they lost that ability or they lost that intrinsic motivation to keep moving forward. Finally, this is kind of wrapping up the entirety of looking at personality. Personality is something that somebody does. It's something that you do. You are your personality. Now, that, that's kind of a contradictory thing because your personality is how people perceive you. It's, it's almost its own entity kind of right out in front of you. I like to think of personality as like an invisible shield in front of me. I'm here and I know me and I know the inner, inner workings of me. But this shield that is right now in front of me is what people see of me. So it's like a two-way mirror. I can see through it and I can see my personality and I see myself, but other people are only gonna see what they know about me and what my behaviors have led them to think my personality is. And so it's what I do, it's how I act. Um, and so when we look at that, we have to know that people are going to interpret our personality and all we can do is keep acting in the way that we want to be consistent with our personality. So a couple of quick questions here. What is, which of the following statements is true about personality? Everybody perceives the world the same way. Everyone has the same chronically accessible constructs. Aggression is not related to perceptions. People who are sensitive to rejection are more likely to think a partner is rejecting them. Let's get rid of A because we know that's not true. Everyone has the same chronically accessible constructs. No, everybody sees the world differently. Aggression is not related to perceptions. Absolutely not. So D, people who are sensitive to rejection are more likely to think their partner is rejecting them. Conscious thought, A, is more important than unconscious thought can happen at the same time, works the same way when people are emotional or calm, has a large capacity. Well, remember, conscious thought is all about our short-term working memory, and that's only the magic number seven. Remember George Miller, uh, the magic number seven plus or minus two, so it's not D. Works the same way when people are emotional or calm. Think about this, watch somebody having an argument. We know that's not true. A is more important than unconscious thought, probably not. I mean, we can't really prove that yes or no, but unconscious thought is really important. So B can happen at the same time as unconscious thought is true. People are motivated to achieve their goals only by short-term goals, to always think the best possible outcomes by the same basic goals as everybody else. Let's, let's get rid of C because uh, we know some uh, pessimistic people, they're out there. Uh, people are motivated by the same basic goals as everybody else? Absolutely not. If you are motivated by the same thing as a toddler, yikes, uh, and, and throughout your life, you're actually gonna have different goals. Um, only by short-term goals? No, it's gotta be A, to achieve their goals. People are motivated to achieve their goals. And in saying that, I am glad to say that hopefully you have achieved a goal because you've gotten through the final lecture of personality psychology. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for uh, really coming and, and paying attention and uh, the way that this course has been put together as a hybrid. Uh, I hope that um, some of the hybrid content that has been online has been beneficial. Um, and some of the in-class stuff has also been uh, helpful in getting you to understand what is going on in personality psychology. As always, Every semester, I try to end the semester by telling you that it's time to get registered for the next semester. Even if you're graduating, come back, take another one just for fun. 
I know I won't see many of you doing that, but uh, this summer we have a lot of psychology, a lot of sociology courses that are offered. Um, I know personally I'm offering a, a section of human sexuality in the summer, a section of abnormal psych in the summer. Uh, we're offering some 101s, which you shouldn't be uh, needing. However, if you know anybody who wants to take a psych 101 course, uh, send them our way. Ivy Tech is great education. Uh, summer classes are a great way to get some courses knocked out. So. From me, I want to thank you all for paying attention, and uh, hopefully we will get together uh, eventually in, in the future, and we can uh, talk more about uh, different forms of psychology. So thank you. Have a great, uh, great rest of your semester.